Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago, one of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a pole of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock, the Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox, pick your favorite, you can choose, as long as the Packers lose, for everything you need to know, it's Bill Swarsky Sports Talk Chicago, Bill Swarsky Sports Talk Chicago. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Bill Swarsky Sports Talk Chicago. This is your hosts, Alex and Sean. On this episode, we've got the Bears crap in the bed in Miami. And chilly today, hopefully hot tamale. (laughs) My dad uses that joke all the time. That's great. Um, Uh, but first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. If you're not familiar with the Rockford Ice Hogs, they're the AHL minor league affiliate of the Chicago Blackhawks. What does that mean for you? You get to see the stars of tomorrow today at family-friendly, affordable prices. The Blackhawks have a lot of young superstars. Hopefully, um, many of them are still right at the cusp of making it to the NHL. They're playing for Rockford right now, so you can go and see them play in beautiful BMO Harris Bank Center in downtown Rockford, Illinois at a very affordable price. And you can tell everybody that you can be a hockey hipster and tell them you saw that player way back when. So head on over to icehogs.com, buy a hat, shirt, jersey, tickets, and more. Tell them Swirsky Sports sent you. Alex, I would ask you how you're doing, but I feel like I already know. Yeah, you know. You know very well. Let's just rip this band-aid off and I'm right there with you. I am so angry and frustrated at this Bears game. That doesn't even scrape the iceberg. I mean, you are coming off of a bye. A coming off of a bye. You are playing a team with their backup quarterback. A backup quarterback with a running joke of you can get a Brock Osweiler Halloween costume and it's somebody dressed in a garbage can. And you lose the game to them. Remember last year coming off the bye week against Brett Hundley? You know, here's here's my... If you were to ask me how I just feel right off the bat, i just tell you that I'm so sick, season after season, when things look like they're really going to pick up, they lose a game like this. Coming off the bye last year against Green Bay with Brett Hundley. 2015, the Blaine Gabbert game at Soldier Field after beating the Packers at Lambeau Field on Thanksgiving. Starting off 3-2 in 2014, and then everything fell apart. You could go on and on. There are so many Bears games you could point to. So many gut-wrenching losses you can point to the past decade. And you say, yeah, that was a lot like this. This reminded me so much of that game in Minnesota in 2013 when they lost in overtime. Reminded me a lot of that. And a bunch of other bad Bears losses. The fact of the matter is, this was a game that you should have won. You were up. after. You can forgive a bad first half if you dominate the second half and you win by a lot, which it looked like it was kind of the case. You had control of the game. You were one touchdown away from icing the game. And as soon as you made a terrible mistake in the red zone, everything about the game changed. You were that close to icing it. And I want to be mad at the officials because the officiating was dog crap. It was absolute dog crap. I mean, between the blatant missed 
uh, delay of game on that play that Frank Gore got to the seven. The blatant missed, hold, uh, missed holding call on Khalil Mack on that long pass that deflected off a Bears player into a random other Miami Dolphin player, his hands. Uh, the phantom roughing the passer call on uh, Leonard Floyd. That was complete bogus. I mean, everyone wants to talk about how bad the the play was or the call was when Clay Matthews hit the guy. At least he hit the guy. Is you know, Leonard Floyd basically olayed him, and they called it a roughing the passer. But you can you can blame the officials all you want. What what really did it was one, you didn't come to play. You didn't start playing until the second half. Two, you were lackadaisical and you didn't put in the effort, especially on defense. Three, two red zone turnovers. Not even in the red zone. Two, one at the goal line, one in the end zone. Two turnovers that would have iced the game. And honestly, mismanagement of the clock and lack of sense of urgency. Those, those are what cost you that game. You don't blame the officials. Because you know what? They were... I, I want to say that the Bears got screwed a little bit more. But you know what? There were bad calls on both sides. I agree with you. I can't be mad at the... I mean, I'm mad at the officiating for being bad. But it was not the reason they lost. Even with those bad calls, the Bears were still in position to win. They were. Um, I thought it was shockingly bad how terrible the defense was coming off a bye. And look, everyone says, yeah, it's really hot and you get exhausted. Okay. I mean, I wouldn't be able to stay out there long in heat either. I, I get that, but you couldn't tackle. You let washed up running backs run all over you. I mean, their run defense was so good. It, today was awful and no excuses whatsoever on that long game tying touchdown that went like what? 75 yards on one play. I mean, that was that was the signature right there. Yeah, I mean, it was it was bogus. Um, I, I just I don't know what else to say. It is the the Bears have to do a lot of soul searching here because it's not about to get any easier for them because they've got the New England Patriots next. And a friend of mine said, you know, hopefully it was the Bears looking past the Dolphins and looking at the New England Patriots. And because the the Dolphins were reeling. But you know what? The Dolphins, where they start 3-0, and a lot of people were saying, this is a really good football team. And the Bears didn't come to play this game. So hopefully that is the case, that they just, the heat got to them, they, and they were looking past this team to look at the Patriots. Because if they are not prepared to play against New England Patriots, Tom Brady is going to eat them alive. And this is a situation, I think, you know, we've said a lot of good things about this Bears team. We've had a lot of critical moments and, you know, they're warranted, I, I would say. Um, you know, obviously, we don't want to go game by game and say, oh, they're going to be Super Bowl contenders or, oh, they're going to finish in last place. You know, the back and forth thing. We, we want to try to avoid that, but the fact of the matter is you have got to go out there and prove that you're an elite team by beating elite teams. You lost against Green Bay. You beat a pretty bad Seahawks team, or at least a mediocre one, if you want to call it that. You barely beat a terrible, terrible Cardinals team. You destroyed a, a Tampa Bay Buccaneers team that... While the record and numbers looked good, I think we can all agree they're not as good as how they started. And then, you know, you didn't have Ryan Tannehill, but the Dolphins aren't the worst team, and you didn't weren't prepared. I'm not trying to downgrade any of those wins, but you got to prove that you're a good team by beating good opponents. And people talk, well, this is a playoff team. It's looking like a playoff team. Prove they're a playoff team by beating the NFC North and beating 
better teams. That's all I got to say about that. I mean, I agree with you. I I agree with you. And here's the thing is the NFL schedule is set. You can only play the teams that are on your schedule in the order that they're at. Right. So I'm not going to beat them up because, oh, they only beat this team or they only beat that team because that's the team on the schedule. But you know what? The Miami Dolphins were on the schedule. They were on the schedule today at noon. The Bears didn't show up until the second half, and they came out. And if they would have played that entire game like they played that third quarter, this would have been another blowout like the game against uh, the the, uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Absolutely. I mean, the first half, it was pretty lucky it was only 7 nothing. I mean, the, the Dolphins didn't exactly play stellar either, but the Bears made way too many mistakes. Way too many mistakes. Now, going back to the defense really quickly, they didn't get any pressure on Brock Osweiler. None. Khalil Mack was hurting a little bit, but your other guys have to step up too. You can't just rely on Khalil Mack and Akeem Hicks. And if there's one thing that may concern me a little bit, I don't want to go, you know, too brash here, but the secondary. Was our secondary exposed today? Because the secondary looks good when the front seven looks good. When the front seven wasn't getting the pressure, well, the secondary wasn't doing its job. I don't know. I I, 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 want to say that the secondary is better than it was today. I really do, because I think there is talent on that secondary. But what we saw today without the front seven doing its job, it didn't look good. Honestly, I think the defense was a huge lack of preparation. And I'm I'm going to throw this at the feet of Vic Fangio. Is it's going to be a different game plan when it's Ryan Tannehill behind the center versus Brock Osweiler. The minute you, if you had any inkling at all that that Ryan Tannehill wasn't going to be playing, and Brock Osweiler was going to play, which we've all week we knew that there was a possibility, and then come Wednesday. Uh, when we heard about MRIs and, uh, you know, if it's the possibilities Brock Osweiler playing, Miami is going to play a different type of game. They're not going to just sit back. A much They're gonna, it's all going to be short dink and dunk passes. Ryan uh, Brock Osweiler is not going down the field and throwing 40-yard bombs. It's going to be dump it off and let and let the uh, the – uh, pattern, um, the wide receiver route, and the athleticism of the receiver do the rest. And he did that. And the wide receivers came through. The running game came through. The offensive line held enough. The, those passes were quick. So Vic Fangio, once it came the second half, got a lot better at it, what he was calling. And you can't you can't have these short uh, plays, these short pass plays, and you have the cornerbacks playing so off because they're just going to pick you apart, pick you apart. And ultimately, the Bears, for the most part, were able to bend but not break. But they're, um, you know, Vic Fangio's unwillingness to send blitzers. Just it was it was infuriating. You're not getting the pressure fast enough. You've got to send a blitzer, and you know, the, the poor tackling of the secondary and just the BS where they called a pick play on one team, but not on the other team that was consistently doing it. It's maddening, but you know, that's, that's all they were doing is they were getting the ball in the hands of a playmaker and he was making plays and the bears weren't. And that's just as simple as that. Yeah, I think you said it best right there. Um, I just don't get how there's so much unpreparedness after a bye week. I really just don't get it. Um, But you know what? Hopefully it's a kick in the pants 
and they better be prepared for Tom Brady and the Patriots next week. Which I, you know, after this loss, you'd think that everything is doom and gloom. And believe me, I'm still pretty mad about this loss. I still think they can beat the Patriots. It, it's it's kind of a different, t- a weird tone here as I'm, you know, venting a lot of frustration. I still think they could beat the Patriots, but if they're going to do that, truly, they better be better prepared than they were today. They were sure as hell prepared for Tampa Bay, not for this one. Yeah, I mean... Here's the thing. New England is beatable. Their defense, their defense, they what they do is they try to take away one aspect of the game you play. And the Bears, honestly, have a balanced attack. They can run the ball with power. They can run the ball with speed. They have wide receiver targets. They've got tight end targets. Um, They can beat you with the quarterback running. So... If they play a good game and the Bears have to have two multiple game plans together because if their game plan is to beat them with Tariq Cohen uh, running speed plays uh, like they did with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and that's something that the New England Patriots and Bill Belichick geared up to stop, then you're in for a long day if you can't do that thing that you practiced for. Yeah. Um, but if you're able to move that ball and you're able to get pressure on Tom Brady, then you can beat them. You can absolutely beat them. But you need, if they're going to do quick passes, you better have a game plan to to keep that in check or to send blitzers because you need to give, you know, you can't expect a, the pass rush to get there in two seconds. You, right. you need you need to be able to if they're gonna if they're gonna do quick passing you need to pr- do press man coverage you've got to be in their face uh, hit them on the, as they're coming off the snap alter their routes and be right there to contest the passes at the line of scrimmage otherwise your pass rush is not going to be able to get there and you're going to get picked apart like what happened today yeah let this be a lesson. I mean, seriously, let this be a lesson. Um, Speaking of quarterbacks, I thought we'd shift gears a little bit. There's been a lot of talk about how Mitch Trubisky did today. Now, I think that his terrible decision on the interception was incredibly costly. And there was a lot of rough moments in the first half. But you know what? I still put Mitch Trubisky lower on the blame list for this one. Lower than the defense, lower than the coaching. I'm just going to be honest with you because they scored a lot in the third quarter and Mitch Trubisky was throwing dimes and he was using his legs and he was utilizing his weapons. Like I think he did a lot of good today despite having a very, very, very costly interception. Because that changed the game right there. I don't know what you think, but I I think that he's, while everyone has to take some blame for this loss, I mean, it's, you could pretty much spread it around pretty much everyone outside Tariq Cohen and Bryce Callahan. There's some blame, but I'm not as mad at him as many other aspects of the team today. I mean, he threw for 316 yards, three touchdowns, one interception, and had a 71% completion rate. I can't, I can't blame him for that loss. And you're right. That, that interception that he threw, and some of those plays at the end, those passes that he threw that didn't get intercepted, were ill-advised. But yeah, they were. That is what you're going to get from a rookie quarterback. And I... Is as much as they hurt, is he's you hope he learns from those and gets better, but he was pretty good. He was pretty good. Is if you asked after after last season, if you would tell me that you would get multiple 300 yard games, multiple touchdowns, I mean, in a two game span, you'd get like 700 yards, uh nine touchdowns and one interception 
from your quarterback, from Mitch Trubisky, you'd take that. Uh, yeah, I it, it, it's you know, and it's it's that's what you get when you have a young quarterback. They're gonna throw costly interceptions, and you just hope you can minimize the damage. And honestly, they still should have won despite that. The Jordan Howard fumble, not excusable. That one's not excusable. The Mitch Trubisky, I can't, I can't defend that pass he threw, but that's you. You have to expect that with young quarterbacks, with a a running back, a veteran running back, you you just don't expect that, and you can't you can't be can be okay with that. Yeah, no, I mean that was a very key mistake, and you know Jordan Howard, his best moments were in overtime. That you know before the Cody Parkey miss, I mean those were his best moments of the game, but yeah, that right there was very costly and what can you say other than he dropped the ball that's no other way to put it no other way to analyze it and that was terrible a terrible time to do it i'm not like him no you gotta you've got to put two hands on that and tuck it away because that's what they're doing um and it's it, it just it hurts um you know, we, I think we've beat up on Matt Nagy quite a bit for uh, not using Jordan Howard enough. And I, after the, the Buccaneers game, a lot of people were like, well, see, you know, look what the coach is doing. You didn't need that many touches and look at the outcome. Here's the thing. If you don't regularly establish the power run game, then when you need to do it, it's it's not you're not ready to do it. Is you've got to establish the dominance of the offensive line throughout the game and be able to run the ball. Is they just sparingly gave Jordan Howard a carry here and there, and he was getting one, two, maybe three yards. And Jordan Howard's a guy that gets stronger as the game goes on. He needs to get those carries. And the offensive line needs to to establish dominance. And so when you started running him in overtime, that's when he was doing well. If you start doing those runs in the first quarter, by the time you get in the fourth quarter, a regular non-overtime game, he's he's able to run the ball. And you can power run things, run the clock down, get first downs. And that's why you need to pound the ball on the ground. I get it. I'm not saying it's we should be back into a John Fox offense where it's power run, power run, power run, pump the ball. I'm saying you need you still need to run the ball efficiently in the NFL, regardless of how innovative your offense is. Well, yeah, and here's the thing about the last week in Tam- against Tampa Bay, you know, they were following a game plan, and that's why not seeing much of Jordan Howard in that game didn't bother me at all because they were following the game plan to pick that secondary apart. That was just part of the game plan. But that's not going to be part of every game plan. You're going to need your power backs. And this was a situation where many times they needed Jordan Howard. And you saw him being used on a lot of third downs and getting first downs, and I thought that was good. And then again, when they used him in overtime, that was good. But, you know, just kind of going into Matt Nagy, you saw a lot of questionable things towards the end. And, you know, the way it was set up for that Cody Parkey field goal over 50 yards, it's that's setting up for a very tough game-winning field goal, and Parkey didn't make it. Yeah, I mean, here's here's my question. And, like, listen, I think Matt Nagy is going to be a very good head coach. And I said this when we hired him, that I liked the hiring but I feel like the Bears got him a year too soon, which is not necessarily a bad thing because I think he would have not been available come next year. And then do we really want another year of John Fox? Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so I think we're going to have to, just like we're, we have to live with mistakes that, that Mitch Trubisky has as a young quarterback, we're going to have to live with mistakes of a rookie head coach that quickly rose through. It's not like he was 
an offensive coordinator for 10 years and uh, has seen so much. This is a guy that rose very quickly and he's still very young and he's got a very good mind for We've seen a football. lot of great calls from but, him. I mean, we have. Yeah. But here we here is where it just boggles my mind. And he's going to go back and he's going to see this on tape. I guarantee. And it's going to, he's going to learn from it. But when in the first quarter, I think it was the first quarter, maybe it was the second quarter, first half of the game, the Bears had that fourth and one. And they yeah, ran a gadget cool. play rather than power run with Jordan Howard. They didn't do that. But then in overtime, when all they needed to do was get into field goal range and they had a very, very long field goal for your kicker, which was like right at his career long, and you had a third and short. And uh, I think that was the time because they were geared up to stop the run because they knew you were going to run and they were you were going to run with Jordan Howard is that would have been a time to do some Absolutely. sort of gadget play, catch them off guard, get that first down and give yourself some more cushion for your kicker, you know, get another set of downs to try to get as many yards as possible. I agree. I completely agree. And that's two spots where he did the wrong thing at the wrong time when he would just flip flop those. I think you would have better results in both situations. I agree. No, I, I was thinking the same thing because on that third down, I'm like, you got to get a first down here. Like th this is a 54 yard field goal. That's going to be really tough to make. So, you know, I, that really yeah. irked me as well. Um, but Hey, at least he didn't uh, kick on second down. That's true. And I, I, you know what I didn't understand is why did the Dolphins run the clock out uh, if they were going for, you know, a fairly easy field goal? Is the game, it's it's not like the Bears were going to march down the field with four seconds. You know, it was, it was if they missed, there was going to be the tie. <laughs> yeah. I don't understand, but whatever. Maybe Buffalo Wild Wings said, hey, we want another tie for our fans. Uh, do that. Um, but, uh, what else was I going to say? Oh, so I already started seeing, um, people bitch and complain about we, we have this kicker when we could have had Robbie gold. Okay. Okay. Let's not forget that the last year of Robbie gold, he missed several big kicks. How many game winners did he miss in that game? And that's that season three. Several. They several. They had multiple losses that were directly on the shoulders of Robbie Gold. And that was the reason that we were paying him. He was one of the highest paid kickers in the league. And he was in the bottom half of the league in kicking overall and had missed multiple game winners. And everybody was in agreement that Robbie Gold needed to go. We needed to upgrade at kicker. And Robbie himself even said afterwards that he got complacent and after the Bears let him go and he sat on his couch for however many weeks before the Giants picked him up, he dedicated himself back to his craft to get better because even though he was mad about it, he knew why he got released. Is kicking in the NFL is a what have you done for me lately league. And just because Robbie Gold is the best kicker in the history of this storied franchise is he sucked in his last year at the Bears and it was time for him to go. Right. I mean, the decision was easy at the time. And, you know, Cody Parkey, how many other field goals has he missed? Has he missed like one, one, two? I, I don't even know. But, you know, overall, he'd be doing, he was doing all right. I just... I think that saying, oh, we need a new kicker now is a little bit of an overreaction. I'd be more upset if this was like a 40-yard field goal or less. But 54 yards, while a lot of kickers are still kind of expected to make that, I mean, that's that's pretty borderline of what a lot of kickers make. I mean, 53, 54 yards, that's, that's a tough field goal. I'm not trying to make all the excuses for him, but... 
it's not I, I, it's not like he missed a chip shot. Yeah, it was it was at his it was at his career long. You signed a kicker that's very accurate from a short distance because you got tired of a kicker that could kick long distances but was erratic from everywhere and you decided to go for a kicker that's very accurate but from a moderate distance. But it's so frustrating honestly is that you know the page or the Panthers they're like yeah, we need to kick a 97-yard field goal to win this game. And their kicker's like, oh, look I'm here. And everyone cheers him, and you have the crazy Spanish broadcast of it. And then the Bears are like, yeah, let me give a 53-yard field goal. And they can't do it. Yeah, it is frustrating. I mean, I can't blame you if you're upset at Parky, but I don't think we need to rise up and say, oh, we need a new kicker now. I think that's going way too far. I mean, that's a Jimmy Johnson move right there is – your kicker misses a kick that's a big kick and he'll cut you like i mean like cut you with a razor he's he's ruthless like that the but literal I, cut not just cut you from the team yeah he, both he will cut you from the team and cut you with a knife that's true <laughs> um is i i don't think you cut parky but you definitely put him on notice that this is you can't you can't be missing kicks uh that's what you do that's you, fair um, but you, I mean, you hope that he's got a short memory with this because kickers are a weird bunch and it is all mind games. And if you, if you get out of a rhythm and you feel like nervous about kicking it because you missed a kick, then you're going to start missing kicks. Mm -hmm. But if you nail a big one, you ride that high and you start kicking everything, you know, no matter how far away. Look at Mason Crosby last week. Prime example. That was brutal. He is a fantastic kicker, mm -hmm. and he missed four field goals and an extra point in one game. I mean, when's the last time we've seen a performance like that, especially a guy of his caliber? Yeah, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. And it definitely doesn't happen with the Bears. I think er, there was a lot of likes on the tweet, but nobody ever misses a field goal when they play the Bears. I feel no like from how far away from – it doesn't matter. They don't miss. And not only do they not miss, they nail it. Like they don't miss. Like, like it's not even like, Oh, it just barely snuck in or it just barely got above the crossbar. They, they nail it. Even 50 plus yards. Every time they're like, Oh, this is a tough kick. They always make it. Like, I thought I was the only one who thought that I'm so glad you tweeted that out. I thought I was the only one that felt that. Yeah. I though that it just, they nobody ever misses, and it's so infuriating. And it's I'm shocked that that 63 yard field goal wasn't against the Bears because that would be such a th thing to happen against the Bears. Like, oh, the Bears got this in the bag. As long as this guy doesn't kick the longest field goal in the history of NFL, and the guy comes out and is like, boom, and kicks it with five yards to spare, dead center in the, between the goalposts. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep. Uh, but what else with this? Um, oh, the Leonard Floyd, uh, uh, personal foul against Danny Amendola. What the hell was that? What, what was he supposed to do? Danny Amendola, they, they didn't blow the whistle. I, it, they, the I was wondering why stopped. they didn't blow the whistle. That they should have called the, the foul on the referee because he didn't blow the whistle. And Danny Amendola, rightfully so, is still fighting to gain yards. And what are you supposed to do? So he just picked him up. He's so small. He's just a little guy. He got picked up. I don't understand it. And he didn't pile drive him down. He just dropped him. Yeah, I mean, I, that was a weird play. That was a very weird play. I, I was really shocked when they didn't blow the whistle because it was like several seconds. Yeah, it was infuriated. I'm like, why didn't he blow the whistle? And then then they throw the, the flag on that. It's infuriating. Um, what else? Bryce Callahan was a bright spot. Uh played really well. Um I have to I'd have to go back and watch on those long plays where the breakdown was. Was it just was an illegal picks that the Bears couldn't go th get through? Was it 
or tackling was it? I, I honestly, I'd have to go back and look, but for the most part, Kyle Fuller played well. Um, got another couple of picks and overall this season, he's played really well. He just got beat up because the two bad, or I mean, you know, two times he got burned were absolute, you know, you couldn't have thrown a more perfect pass and he got beat for touchdowns and they were high profile ones. But other than that, Kyle Fuller has played really, really well for this team. Yeah, he has. Um, and, you know, people could say, oh, those are just bad throws by Osweiler. He didn't really do much. It's like, well, you still got to play your position, and he was able to do it. So you got to give him credit for that. Um, yeah, the, the defensive line of the Bears, they just looked like they were sucking wind. No, yeah. Every time there was a play stoppage, hands on the hips, bent over at the hips, trying to catch wind. And I'm going to chalk that up to heat. Um, but you know, you you that's why you practice hard in training camp because it's the hot weather, and you're practicing hard. So moments like this, you're ready to play. You know, they're not going to play another 90 degree game in this season. No, they're not because, uh, yeah. Cause the, the next, uh, next two are in Chicago, right? So, uh, Patriots are playing in Chicago, correct? Right. They're at soldier field. And then, uh, so uh, I, I got a schedule on the other side of the room. I can't see it from here, but, um, uh, the jet, the jets are the next game after that. Okay. And that's in Chicago. Okay. Cause I'm going to that game. Um, but then after that you're in November. And I don't think anywhere you're playing is going to be 90 degrees. Um, so, yeah, you're hopefully if that's the issue, we're done and gone with that. Yeah. I mean, hey, Roquan Smith, he's used to the hot weather and he looks good today. But, um, yeah, everything else, you could definitely tell that there were times when they just looked gassed out there. So don't want to deal with that again. And it doesn't look like we will. Um. Yeah. That's all I got on that. Uh, let's see. Bears schedule. Um, so next week is the New England Patriots. And that's in Chicago. Uh, you've got... Oh, why this kicked me out of it? Going back to this. Um There we go. Uh, so Patriots next week in Chicago, the Jets the week after that in Chicago. Then you go to Buffalo. Buffalo on November 4th is not going to be 90 degrees. Then after that, uh, it is Detroit at, in Chicago, Minnesota in Chicago. Then you go to Detroit, which is a dome. Then in December, you go to New York, the Giants. That is not going to be a dome. You get the Rams in Chicago, the Packers in Chicago. Then De uh, December 23rd, you go to San Francisco. That will not be 90 degrees. Then you go to Minnesota, which I believe is a dome. Yeah, that's a dome. So, so yeah, you will not hit 90 degrees anymore. <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, I don't, don't want to use it as an excuse, but it certainly didn't help um, a lot of the defenders out there, but. You still got to execute. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, absolutely. I don't want to use that as, as an excuse. And I'm taking that excuse off the table because you will not have it to lean on any anymore. You have cold or moderate temperatures the rest of the way. And you cannot use heat as an excuse ever again for this season. Yeah, exactly. So at least at least that's that's behind us. Um, let's see what else offensive line, offensive line played. Okay. There was times where, you know, there was some, some pass rush that got to Trubisky and that was a knock on Trubisky is his pocket awareness still not where it needs to be. There was times where he just ran right into pressure, um, or just was not, not sensing it. But for the most part, the bears gave him a very clean pocket and time to throw. So 
Uh, kudos to them on that. I thought they looked a lot better in the second half. You saw some rough moments in the first half, but the second half, that they were pretty key in allowing them to score a lot of those points. I mean, you saw Trubisky able to have time to throw. You saw him move around. Um, so I was disappointed in them in the first half, but the second half, I, I'd agree, they played much better. The wide receivers played really well. Um, you they saw, were great. Yeah, you saw some great catches, some runs after the catch. Taylor Gabriel, he is mesh, meshing very well with this team. Yeah, absolutely. He's turning out to be of the you know the free agent wide receivers to be the guy. The you know you brought in Burton, you brought in Robinson, you brought in Gabriel, and he's been he's been the you know the best one so far. I mean, it's a long way to go in the season and for the contracts, but so far so good. Yeah, I, I got to give it that. Um, you, uh, Tariq Cohen, absolutely. He's my player yeah, of the he, game. He was fantastic. Uh, I know he had that fumble, but, you know. He, they didn't end up scoring on that fumble, and that was after he contributed a hell lot to this offense. Yeah, it, it, one one blip in a otherwise fantastic game. Uh, and, and Mitch Trubisky, I thought he, I was very nervous that he was going to follow up that fantastic breakout game with a flop game and first half started off pretty floppish. Uh, there was the overthrow on, uh, on Miller. Um, there was some absolute missed guys that were open when he was scrambling. We missed wide open guys. You just didn't see them. Um, he's still staring down receivers a little bit. It's lack of pocket awareness. But when they came back with the second half, he played really well. Uh, I mean, he did have that awful, awful, awful interception in the end zone. But besides that, he made the throws he needed to make. Uh, he led that team. He looked pretty good. And overall, stats look good. Yeah, I agree. Again, there's just that that one bad interception really irked me, but they just got to move on now. And that's what you got to do with this whole game. But my last overall big thought with this game is this. I don't want this to be one of those losses where in late December, you're looking back and you're thinking about playoff scenarios and you think that, this is a game that negatively impacted that scenario because you can go back the last few years, the bears were in a playoff race and didn't make it. Whether it was 2012, 2013, 2008, you turn back and you say that, oh, that one game, if you just would have had that, this would have been wrapped up by week 17. I just, it, football is a sport where every win and every loss can mean everything. And bad losses like this, you don't want it to negatively impact a potential, you know, playoff position if the Bears are in fact in a position like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, and you know, honestly, I still don't think this is the year for them if they make the playoffs. I don't think they they make a lot of noise. Um, so. I'm not going to beat them up as much as I will. I, Cause I think everybody's going to learn from this from Trubisky to that defense to Nagy. I, I really think that everybody's going to learn from this and start bringing it. Um, you still have a division lead. You've got some very winnable games coming up with the jets. You've got the, the New York giants. Um, you've got the 49ers. Um, but ultimately, it's going to come down to can you beat can you beat your division opponents? Can you beat the Lions? Can you beat the Vikings? You already lost one to the Packers that you should have won. Can you avenge that? If you win the games in your division, you will win your division. That's and if you what don't, it comes down to. You don't go to the playoffs exactly, and so, that's the biggest challenge for this team. Yeah, you you lost this game. You still have a division lead. You still have that no matter what. Uh. It's just, how are you going to respond to this? If you go out and beat the Patriots next week, then you know what? You 
I think everybody expected them to win this game and lose the next week. If you go into a two game stretch where everybody in the world expects you to be one and one and you come out of it one and one, it's a wash. You lost the one that you were supposed to win. If you can win the one you're supposed to lose, you're, you know, you're right where you expected to be. Yeah, that's, that's a good way of looking at it. And it's just, I just, I'm just, I'm sick of losing these games like this. We've seen it so many times over the years, and a lot of these games have ruined potential Bears runs, and I just, I know it's very early in the season, I understand that, but oh, we've seen this movie so many times. It's just frustrating. And, and, and speaking of Trubisky, and I know when Trubisky was still under John Fox and in that handcuffed offense, I didn't like the comparisons with other quarterbacks. But because that door has already been opened, Mitch Trubisky threw for 316 yards, uh, three touchdowns, one interception, and um, you know led his team to a lot of points. Deshaun Watson, oh, he threw for 71% of completions. Deshaun Watson today threw for a 60% completion, 177 yards, one touchdown, two interception, and was sacked seven times. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. So, yeah, not not very good. And uh, right now is you are going in halftime, and Pat Mahomes has 100 yards, no touchdowns, and one interception. So, you know, Mitch, Mitch is... You can beat them up for our first season. You can beat them up for those first couple of games. But the arrow's pointing up on him. And it's clear, no matter what you thought of him before, when they drafted him, before the draft, all of last season, all the way up to this point, is you could have your opinion. But it's the fact is, he is not a bust. Far from a bust. And his arrow's pointing up. I don't know what his ceiling is. But he's not a bust, and his arrow is pointing up. Yeah, and this loss wasn't his fault. Yeah, I mean that's that's one nice thing to take away from this game, like I said. And I think he's getting a lot more confidence in himself and throwing the deep ball because he is connecting with his guys downfield. He wasn't doing that the first few games. Now you're seeing him throw dimes down the field to Gabriel and Burton and Allen Robinson. So that is a good sign, and that is something to be happy about. Uh, and just an FYI, I don't know if you play fantasy football or not. I have four leagues, and I'm struggling to struggling really hard to keep track of them all. I, I played in my first league this year. I got bullied into go playing, pick, taking over a team for somebody that was leaving. Um, so last minute I joined and I have my court, it's a two quarterback league and my quarterbacks are Josh Allen and Derek Carr. Woof. So my, my two quarterbacks and my defense got me a total of 17 points. And my opponent had Russell Wilson, and he had 41 points by himself. And they've got Pat Mahomes, who's still playing. So, yeah. I'm Not getting, looking too good. No, I'm getting crushed. I was actually doing well because I had Fitzmagic during the Fitzmagic. And now he's just a bench guy. Yeah. At least you don't have Eli Manning. Which I don't, but I'm just saying, at least you don't have Eli Manning. Yeah. Ugh. Ugh. But um, I think one last thing I wanted to talk about is the Bears still haven't given up a rushing touchdown. They almost did, but then uh, Keem Hicks got that fumble, so yeah, good for them. Even though we got ran all over today. That, that Kenyon Drake, Kenyon Drake just yeah. dropped it. God. Just dr- plain old dropped it. And I thought that game was over and 
I was in the middle of an obs- like an obscenity. And then I was like, wait a minute, he dropped it. Yeah. <laughs> what an unbelievable turn of events. Hey, keeps the streak alive. And woohoo. I, I went from I went from highest of highs to lowest of lows, back to highest of highs, then down to lowest of yeah. lows. <laughs> it was a roller coaster yeah, of emotion. Today, hot tamale. Uh, do you have anything you else you want to talk about with the Bears? Not really. I think uh, I think I've said my piece uh, both here and on Twitter, and my personal reflection video that I put on Twitter. I'm officially done with this game. Move on the next week. Dunzo. Yeah. If, if if any of the listeners want to comment or have questions, feel free to let us know. Uh, uh, more than happy to talk about it. But hopefully, everybody just wants to forget this awful game and pretend it never happened. Right and, on. And let it f- don't let it fester and just bury it in the backyard. Deep, deep in the backyard by the sewer pipe behind the garage. <laughs> Hit it and, with a shovel. Yeah, and put some mulch over it. Lots of mulch. And then plant pretty flowers on top of it. Nice, pretty, pretty flowers for Buttercup to roam in. <laughs> Plant some tobacco plants for John Lackey. John, we're planting flowers, not tobacco plants. So I'll use sunflowers as chaw any day of the week. Oh, God. Now there's going to be sunflower chew all over the place. Uh, <clears throat> I want to talk quickly about bulls. Um, is I, I don't know what I was going to talk about this week, but we're we're getting really close to the season starting. I think by the next show, the the regular season will have started for the Bulls. Isn't it like tomorrow or Tuesday? I I think it's like Tuesday or Wednesday, something like I that. I will go on the um, website and check. But the first thing that popped up was Tex Winter, the the Godfather, of the Triangle offense passed away this week. Um. You know, big big important name with the Bulls. If you were around during their the, the Jordan championship era, Tex Winter was a huge part of that. Uh, so rest in peace, Tex. I didn't even hear that. Wow, it's sad. Yeah, he died like Wednesday. How old Thursday? was he? Oh, he's old. He's like oh, is that old? Something. Huh. Yeah, he was old. Um. He was old. He was old, you know, in the 90s. Okay, here we go. 2018-2019 regular season. They open Thursday in Philadelphia. That's a rough one to start, too, because the Philadelphia team is good. Yeah, you start in Philadelphia. Then you come home and you play Detroit. That's going to be your home opener. Then you head out to Dallas to play the Mavericks and then home against the Hornets and then away against the Hornets and then at the Hawks. Then your next home game after that is the Golden State Warriors. And then the last game of the month is another home game against the Nuggets. So you have some not so great opponents with some pretty dang great opponents sprinkled in there. Uh, But they wrapped up a pretty rough um, preseason with essentially the benching of Jabari Parker. Uh, You took him out of the starting lineup. And he was clearly not happy about that. No, he was not. Um, I didn't really watch much preseason. I just, I know about the whole taken out of the starting lineup thing with Jabari Parker. I saw the scores and let me tell you, let me warn you, but you probably already know this. The Bulls defense this year, it's going to be rough. Yeah, I mean, Jabari Parker basically said, "Yeah, I wasn't brought here to play defense. <laughs> this is I was. Oh, everyone is a defender, floor. right? Yeah, there, there's not a lot of defenders on this team, and he's definitely not one of them. I, I think they're going to be fun to watch because I, I really feel this Bulls team can score a lot of points, but it's going to be shootouts night in, night out. Um, yeah." And I think the first month is going to be a bit rough since you don't have Laurie Markinen. You just hope that Wendell Carter takes advantage of the opportunity in the, um, and and is playing more um, 
you just you just try to find bright spots with uh with the injury but a theme that with the the minutes i watched of the preseason was this bulls team turns the ball over like crazy turnover 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 they were a turnover machine in the preseason and i hope i hope that is not the theme for the regular season because it's going to be another brutal one to watch if that's the case. Yeah, it's there's going to be a lot of bad with, you know, some good to watch. You, I'm not expecting them to do anything, but if you're not going to tank, you at least hope that they'd be worth watching. And I think they can be. I mean, Wendell Carter Jr. is going to be the guy to watch when Laurie Markkinen's out, obviously. Um, and, you know, I, I I do really like Jabari Parker. Uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll see how he plays. We'll, we'll see how he plays. Um, obviously, Levine and Dunn are your other young guys. And outside that, got Omer Sheik and Robin Lopez at center. I mean, Robin Lopez, I think, is still a solid veteran. But you know who I'm most looking forward to? The great man himself. You know who I'm thinking of? Who are you thinking of? Cameron Payne. Woo. Oh, the dancing machine. Hell yeah. But here's the thing. is I think, I mean, for me at least, when the Bulls traded Jimmy Butler, I was not happy with the trade. I felt like I felt like they threw in that extra pick that they didn't need to throw in. And that were you know, it wasn't that I wanted them to keep Jimmy Butler. I knew trading him was the right thing. I just didn't think the the package they got was that good. And a lot of people would agree with you. Uh but then when I saw Larry Markin in play and um I saw the potential with Levine and Dunn and you know how little that you expect from that draft pick that got included anyway. I was like, all right, I actually think the Bulls got a very good package for Jimmy Butler. But now with all the shenanigans going on, that Jimmy being Jimmy, oh man, does this trade Dude. look that much better? Dude, this is this is legit getting weird. The whole Jimmy Butler thing, this is getting weird. I am so glad I we I mean here this is not a knock on Jimmy being able to play. Jimmy Butler is a fantastic basketball player, but his antics done. I'm so glad I don't have to listen to it. So glad it's not with the Bulls. It, Thibodeau can deal with it. Not my problem. Not my not my not my circus, not my peanuts. I hear you. I think that it's looking better and better that we made that trade and that we may be getting the better end of the deal because who knows if he's even going to be in Minnesota for much longer. I mean, it, taking on to show that his teammates that he's the best and then doing that interview, what the hell? I, I just, he, it's like, he seems like a crazy person right now. I like how he called ESPN to be there for the shenanigans. Just, just weird. And I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm glad we don't have to deal with this crap because us Bulls fans have dealt with a lot of crap. But luckily, this is not one of them. Ah. Uh. I don't really have anything else to say about basketball. I've watched sparing amounts of, of preseason. Um, I mean, I am excited to watch regular season. I think even though this team is not going to be very good, I think that in a poor East that it's wide open and they can be, com they can be competitive with most teams in the East and there's going to be a lot of scoring. So uh, yeah, you know, bring on the regular season. And I, I and regular season means we'll probably be talking to C Dub and Big Dave, so that'd be cool. Yeah, now I want to get your brother and and C Red Fred on as well. Oh my god, you're you're just asking for a bloodbath. That would be great. I know it's going to be hilarious though. Oh yeah, 
Uh, but I, I, I was not planning to bring up Cubs, but then in a surprise but not surprise move, they parted ways with the Chili Man. Chili Davis is so long, and thanks for all the soft grounders. Well, you know, I thought that this move was very telling when they gave out the details saying that in the exit interviews, the players were clearly frustrated with the way he was coaching them. And I think that, you know, Chili Davis, in the end, wasn't the right fit here. You know, I think he's a very knowledgeable guy. I think he's a very good guy from what I've heard. You know, I don't know him personally, but, you know, people seem to like his personality. He just didn't fit here. And... You know, props to the Cubs for saying, well, if we're not getting good feedback here, then we're just going to take action. And it's pretty evident that things went for the worst with the offense. The power dropped, the weak grounders up, uh, went up, and Theo Epstein was explaining in detail how that all went down, and he was clearly frustrated with it himself. I'm not normally one to be like, oh, the hitting coach, totally their fault why it's not happening because for the most part, these guys are who they are, but um, you see trends in things, which makes me feel like it's a more important position than maybe I was giving it credit for. And I went back and looked because Chili Davis had been the hitting coach in Boston previously. And I went back and looked because I have a lot of friends from Boston that are Red Sox fans. And I, and I looked at the, what they were saying when the Cubs got Chili Davis and basically the universal answer was, thank God Chili Davis is gone. The team power dropped dramatically when he was the hitting coach here. And when you see the same thing happen with the Cubs that happened with the Red Sox, you you go, oh, maybe it's something with his philosophy. What is he doing? And I don't know what it was that he was doing to to, to help do his part to to minimize the home runs and um and have this team just drop so precipitously in offensive production when it's needed, but it's clear that it was his time to go. Yeah, I think it sounded like what it was is they were trying to be more contact hitters and, you know, you may up your contact with the ball, but you're driving the ball less because you can down those strikeouts, but when the strikeouts go down and you're putting more balls in play, it's more likely that you're not swinging for the fences. And again, you want to see more discipline from the team, obviously, and you always want to cut down strikeouts, but... When you're altering the swings just to make contact and not to hit it out of the ballpark, then you're going to see those those results. And I'm not a hitting coach by any means, but, you know, it, it's really telling when you're fired after one season and the players were clearly frustrated with how they were being coached. If that's what you're hearing, then it was pretty obvious that it wasn't working. It's going to be curious to see who they do bring in. Um, it is what I'm hearing as far as leading candidates are Andy Haynes, who is the assistant hitting coach, and he was the assistant hitting coach with uh, John Maley and Chili Davis. So he he knows he knows these hitters. Uh, it's not like he's coming in and you know being a black box to them and vice versa. Um, Eric Hinsky is another one. Um, he was, uh, uh, he was, he was actually with the Cubs as a former first base coach, but he's currently the angels hitting coach. And who knows if he's going to be actually be around because, um, he's under contract with the angels, but Mike Sosha stepped down. So who knows who's going to take that job? And if they're going to keep him, he might be let go and be made available. Um, let's see, uh, I've heard the Rangers hitting coach as, a potential, um, guy, Dave Magadan. Um, uh, let's see, 
Dave Magadan was a, a guy that was mentioned. Kevin Euclid. And I've even heard some people throw on the name uh, David Ross. For hitting coach. And, and that's the... And that, that's why my, my opinion too is I just just because somebody was a fan favorite as a, as a player doesn't mean that they should be brought in as a coach. Well, I mean, look, look at all the, oh, people want David Ross to manage, yada, 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 if man goes. You're, when you're a contending team, I think the last thing you want to do is hire somebody with no experience. And I think that even though they're a talented team and even though the Red Sox were better, you saw them hire Aaron Boone, who has no experience, and I think that may have hurt them a little bit. I mean, Joe Girardi brought them within one win of the World Series. And yeah, you could say Joe Girardi's a little too old school. I won't disagree with you there, but just to hire someone with no coaching experience to be a manager, don't do that. I mean, you know what? When it was tossed around that maybe David Ross would be the new bench coach after Davey Martinez got hired away by the Nationals, that's a position I'd be like, okay. I can yeah, see that's that. that's different. That's a different one. That's different. Even first base, third base coach, I'm okay with that. But hitting coach or manager, no. Exactly. No. Exactly I mean, my point. I remember when Cubs fans were so mad that the Cubs didn't hire Ryan Sandberg to be a, uh, to be their manager. Well, that was a thing for many years. And he got the shot in Philadelphia, and he he was terrible. Yep. Uh huh. That was a thing from pff, ever since Dusty left to 2013. And, you know, we dodged a bullet there is, you know, just because you liked a guy like I love Ryan Sandberg. Ryan Sandberg is one of my all time favorite Cubs, but I doesn't mean I want him to be the manager of the team. How many, how often have we seen Hall of Fame uh, bleh, words, Hall of Fame players turn to terrible managers just because you're great at the sport doesn't mean you're going to be a great manager. Absolutely. Um, you know, one name that I, I haven't heard tossed around, but would be interesting as far as hitting coach. And he's a guy that was in the Cubs organization as a player development guy in the minors is Manny. Yep. Mm, I was talking about him the other day. That's an interesting one because, I I mean, you know, it's another situation where just because he was a great hitter doesn't mean that he's going to be a great hitting coach. But, I mean, he worked with Javi. Javi definitely improved. Uh, the the Cubs brought him in, you know, as a, in a coaching type capacity in the minors, so they felt comfortable with what they were, you know, doing with him and. I at least think that's a name to consider when you're when you're making your long list. Yeah, absolutely. No, I I'm pretty pro Manny. I, I'd be okay with Manny. And Kevin Euclid, you brought him up. That's another interesting name. Yeah, I mean, I I always like the idea of having a guy that you at least are familiar with. Um, yeah, you know, exactly. Think, he was. A, I, they were in the system. Yeah, he Kevin Euclid is familiar with with Theo from his time in the Red Sox, Manny time with the Red Sox, plus his time with the Cubs. Um, Eric Hinsky, he was here previously in a different role. I like the idea of a guy who's qualified to do the job that you have working knowledge with as either a player or, or as, you know, a coaching role. Yeah, I, I'd be all for that. I'm just curious of of when this hiring will happen. Uh, I think it's going to be a little time. I, yeah, I, I'm. I mean, you know, some of those names are going to be available now. The 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 only way it's 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 going to take some time is if they're actually considering somebody from the Brewers, the Dodgers, the Astros, or the the Red Sox, because those are the teams left that you can't talk to people. But if, if anybody else, either they're jobless, they're in the minors or they're on another team, their seasons are over. 
they're fair game to talk to. So, um, you know, maybe that's telling if it's going to take some time that they do have somebody in mind that's in one of those other organizations. Right. Um, yeah, it, it's going to be interesting to see. So, yeah, I mean, right now, I'm just waiting for this off season to truly kick off and that's going to be, you know, the winter meetings and all that stuff. And you got to get through the postseason first. So it's going to be a long off season. One thing I kind of want to say, just because it doesn't relate to the Cubs at all, but I read a quote from Prince Fielder and somebody asked him how Craig council helped him. And he goes, I remember once I was thinking about bunting and he said, Prince, if you bunt, I'm going to punch you right in your face. I saw that. That was wonderful. <laughs> that was great. I was like, all right, then. <laughs> I just, little Craig Council punching Prince Fielder. Prince Fielder would, you know, suplex him and then break him in half. But and then it's him. still a funny quote. <laughs> no, he's vegan. <laughs> oh, that, he is? Yeah. Oh, good for him. But uh, it was that was a funny quote, and when I saw that, I just I was like actually laughing out loud. Hmm, <laughs> that was funny. Have you been watching a lot of the postseason? Haven't watched a single pitch. Hmm. Yeah, I got the ALCS on right now, but uh, I haven't been as into it because I'm still kind of salty about how the Cubs went out. But you know, that's just me. That's where I am. I just was frustrated. Yeah. Um, but Especially I, watching I mean, the Brewers point, do no wrong. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, luckily our future second baseman slash shortstop is, is, you know, hitting the ball well against the uh, Brewers. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I'm just saying is I've been keeping up with these box scores and things, but I just haven't watched any of the games because it's been salty. But I'm rooting for the Astros and and the Dodgers in the World Series. Rematch? You you going for the rematch? Yeah. I mean, I'm even okay if it's the Red Sox. I just anybody I'm at, I'm in the camp of anybody but the Brewers. Yeah, I feel like if the Brewers win, I'll be extra salty. Uh, so let's wrap this up, talk a little Blackhawks. All right. Um they are on pace for 82 overtime games in this season. Crazy, right? Is five straight overtime games. Uh, this team, they are very fun to watch offensively, but oh my goodness, are they atrocious as a defensive team and terrible goaltending. Yeah. I mean, look at Jonathan Taze. I think you got to absolutely love what you're seeing from him. He looks like he's in his youth again. You love the young talent of Alex Debrinkit. He had the overtime goal the other night. And Patrick Kane looks like Patrick Kane. I mean, those three guys are doing so much of the scoring, and you hope that they can keep it up because they've been key to getting points in every game they've played. But boy, oh boy, watching the game against St. Louis the other night, just some of the bad play in the defensive zone and so many fails to clear, so many turnovers. Ugh, it's it's just it's bad. It was it was even worse in that wild game. The wild game, oh it was Oh, you were 23 seconds away from winning. That game was so frustrating because of all the turnovers. And it was it was like every period was a different game. The first period, the Blackhawks dominated. The second period, the wild dominated. The third period, the Blackhawks dominated until the last waning seconds. And then in overtime, it was it was wild. Yeah. Uh, you know, you had – they were allowing guys to stand in front of the, the goal and they weren't paying the price. Um, you weren't hitting those guys. Uh, you had players coming from behind the play with no, you know, no defensive bodies in front of them. It's – you know, you're seeing some good things from some of the young defensive players, but for the most part, overall, this team has just been bad defensively, and they yeah. don't have a safety valve to help them out. 
you hope Corey Crawford comes back, but even when Corey Crawford does come back, there's only so much he can do about some of those bad turnovers. And let's talk about Cam Ward for a sec. Cam Ward is really weird because he has let in some incredibly soft goals and the numbers look very ugly. But I'm not going to lie. He's also come up with some really massive stops in some of these games. It's very strange to explain Cam Ward. He was huge in that Blues game. He made some amazing stops to help them get two points in that last game. Even in the wild game, he had a lot of saves. And, um, you know, some of those bad goals that they let in, I mean, nothing he can do is if you're on one side taking away that that post and a pass goes right across you and there's no defensive help, uh, you know, it's hard to expect a backup goalie to go post to post with, you know, to stop a one-timer. Like, it just, it's it's a lot to ask. Um, you know, if it's Hall of Fame level goalie playing his best day, yeah, he'll he'll do something. But you're asking a back, what it amounts to a backup goalie to, to do an absolutely just highlight reel save. And it just, it's too much to ask for somebody. Right. A lot of those bad turnovers and you're left out to dry, that's got to get better. I mean, that's flat out got to get better. You're getting wins now, but you can't continue to do that and expect to win throughout the season. And you saw it last year. You started off pretty solid record-wise, and then the bad defense caught up with you. It's just, it's got to be better. It's going to happen when you have a a scoring drought is, you know, you can't just keep outscoring everybody. Um, especially when you've got a terrible power play. You finally scored a power play goal in uh, the wild game. Um, and also you're just the shot numbers. You're, you're being way outshot by, by teams in some of these games. I mean, um, you know, the, the wild game, they got way outshot for the game. The blues, they got way outshot in the third period, way outshot that uh, in that period that counts. And um you know, it's uh, you know, it's a situation where that offense is firing, but the defense is terrifying and not in a good way. And you know, I don't think this will ever be a fantastic defense this year, but you hope that they could at least be like maybe average at best. It's it's hard to see them kind of really turning it around quickly, but you hope that they could at least play adequate defense. And if you have Corey Crawford back, that'll help you a lot. Like I said, it's never going to be great, but I think it's realistic to demand a little bit better. I mean, Coach Q is going to demand better. If the team wants to win, they're going to need better. Let's say that. Yeah. Um, I mean, and you're seeing some good things. Like Henry D- uh, Joka Harju is, is playing well. Uh, you know, you'll see some young mistakes from him, but he's, he's so young, but he's playing well. And you're actually seeing him beat out Duncan Keith and time on the ice. If you actually look at the numbers. And by the way, congrats to Keith on his 1000th game the other night. Yeah, that was, that was good. Um, and speaking of that, I don't know. Uh, I think it was Mark Lazarus tweeted out what the Blackhawks roster was for Duncan Keith's first game with the Blackhawks. It was like unrecognizable. Did you? Yeah, here's the roster. So this is Duncan Keith has uh, played 1000 games with the Blackhawks. And for first game, this was the Blackhawks roster. Tyler Arneson, Adrian Acoin, Matthew Barnaby, Mark Bell, Renee, Renee Bork, Bork Curtis Brown, Kyle Calder, uh, Jess and Cullimore, Eric Daze, Jim Dowd, Matt Ellison, Duncan Keith, My Martin LaPointe, uh, Tuomo Rutu, Brent Seabrook, Todd Simpson, Jim Vandermeer, and Pavel Voryobiv. I don't remember most of these guys. Hey, Rene Bork, Martin LaPointe, the captain before Jonathan Taze, uh, Bell, I remember Bell, Eric Daze, I think we all remember Eric Daze. Barnaby, I don't remember him. I I always liked Eric Daze. A lot of people did. I just it's too bad because he seemed like a very talented guy, but I know he had back issues. 
Uh, but that was a oof, oof team there. Not, not good. Not good. Um, let's see. Uh, what else? The Blackhawks. The um, being reported that Corey Crawford could be the in the uh, between the net or between the pipes the next game, which is not until Thursday. Yeah, against the Coyotes. I know they were saying that a few weeks or maybe a week ago. Um, let's hope so. Let's hope he's ready to go. I don't want him to be forced, but I'm hoping that he's ready to yeah, go. Yeah, this is a this is a fairly long break the Blackhawks are getting. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday off before a game on Thursday. Yeah. After playing three games in four days to start the season, it's probably nice. It will playing five overtime games and five opportunities. Yeah. Um, somebody tweeted out though is being like uh you know as with the the winning str- the winning percentage that they're on and if they were to go into overtime for all of their games for the rest of the season then they'll have the best record in the league. <laughs> oh yeah. Hey, I wonder if they could uh what if they could match that 2013 point streak? <laughs> Probably not. No, they're not going to. I'm just that is that is not going to happen. Imagine if they if they reached that streak, but like it was more overtime losses than wins. So you're like, well, you have this point streak, but like doesn't look nearly as good as that 2013 one because most of these were OT losses. That would just be really funny. That would be ridiculous. <laughs> at least at least it hockey would. has a much better way of dealing with ties than than the NFL. Yeah, I honestly, some people like to knock the overtime rules in the NHL. I think they're fine the way they are. I'm, I'm good with it. I'm I good do. with it. Yeah, I don't think they need to change anything. Uh, but I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to talk about. No, I think I'm good. Um, so I think that's going to do it for this episode of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Um, I want to thank everybody for listening. Uh, please hit us up on social media at ShyFanPat1 at Swirsky Sports. Facebook.com slash Swirsky Sports, Swirsky Sports.com. Uh, hit subscribe on however you listen to podcasts, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, the TuneIn app. And your job this week is to share this podcast with at least one friend who likes Chicago sports. Um, so, yeah, that's going to do it for this episode. And thanks so much for listening. And until next time, bear down. Oh, I don't want her, you can have her, she's a Packer fan, she can't fit in my van, and she looks like a number New Yorkers, smoking crack is not legal on the planes. Bears, 31, the negative 7. The Bears, oh, when the Bears go bearing down.